I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Uh, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. Um, so we need to be very careful with the artificial intelligence. I'm increasingly inclined to think that there should be some uh, regulatory oversight uh, at the inter at maybe at the national and international level, uh, just to make sure that uh, we don't do something very foolish. Um, I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know, you know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's like, "Yeah, you sure you can control the demon?" <laughs> then work out. On the screen behind me, you can see two videos playing side by side. One shows a short clip of a well-known sci-fi film. Anyone recognize it? Blade Runner. It's an interesting film that riffs on the notion of what it is to be human and what it is to be a machine. Now, on the right-hand side, the right-hand video, on the other hand, is an unusual video. It was not curated by man or woman. It was created by Elon Musk's demon, an AI. In fact, to be technical, it was created by a deep autoencoder decoder network by one of the grad students at Goldsmiths University. <coughs> what they did, they took frame after frame from the film Blade Runner, presented that to the deep autoencoder decoder network and for itself without any human intervention the network worked out 200 interesting features where interesting was defined by the network itself in each frame and represented them as a vector of 200 reels the decoder part of that system then took those 200 reels and reconstituted a video from that. I think you'd agree from 200 numbers the results are nothing short of fantastic. In fact so much so that when Terence put a video of his work onto YouTube he received a cease and desist copyright infringement notice from Warner Brothers. For much of the 20th century, the dominant cognitive paradigm seated the mind in the brain. If computers can model the brain, then the theory goes, it ought to be possible to program them to act like minds. And in the latter part of the 20th century, this astonishing hypothesis, the phrase comes from Francis Crick, who asked, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. This hypothesis is so alien to the minds of most people today that it can be truly called astonishing. Well, this astonishing hypothesis fueled an explosion of interest in an area of artificial intelligence called artificial neural networks. The idea that we can build intelligent machines by replicating at some level of granularity and fidelity the operation of the brain. So we have engineers building very coarse and dirty approximations uh, to the real brains deep learning systems, if you like, to do useful tasks like play a great game of Go or track images in a video scene. And we have neuroscientists, on the other hand, who are very interested in building very high fidelity models of individual neurons and stacking these together 
to build large-scale computational models of the brain. You may or may not know that the largest EU grant ever funded is called the Human Brain Project, and it's their goal to build a computational simulation, initially of an area of the mouse cortex, but eventually of the human brain. Now, the question that Crick's astonishing hypothesis uh, raises is, of course, that if we ever succeed in building an accurate, high-fidelity simulation of the brain on a computer, will we also have instantiated everything about the human mind? Now, we can think of artificial intelligence as the science and engineering of making machines do clever things, from playing a strong game of chess to helping drive a car. And if we position the birth of artificial intelligence with Alan Turing's 1948 first attempt at writing a chess program, then the field is, over, is approximately 70 years old. And I've been working within the field of AI now for over 36 years. That's over half its life. But n and fashions and fads have come and go over that time, but nothing has been quite like the excitement that is around artificial intelligence now. As an example of this hype, it happened to me a few years ago with some software we developed with Art UK and the University of Reading called Spend Insight. Spend Insight was used AI to identify price variants. Sounds really tediously boring compared to building terminators, but that's what pays the bread and butter of our work at TCEDA. We were designing software that would identify price variants on NHS procurement contracts. It might be surprised to you to know that one a trust in London might be paying 50p for a 100 milliliter sy uh, syringe, and another one might be paying £1.50. Now, if everybody could buy at the cheapest rate, that has the potential to save the NHS a lot of money. Well, the software we developed, and I believe this was back in the day, but I believe it's still being um, marketed by Art UK, called Spend Insight, was actually audited and used by the UK National Audit Office. So now for once we can give real data that's been independently generated for our software, not just some marketing hype that I've come up with. But the NAO set, uh, found that when they used our software and looked at NHS procurement spend, that if buyers acted on the price variances that we found for them, then the NHS could save upwards of £500 million per year. And that's an awful lot of doctors and nurses. Now, at the time, I very naively thought that Spend Insight would be hailed as the saviour of the NHS. I mean, it wasn't, of course, and I doubt that many of you, if any, will have ever heard of it before. Because little did I know at the time, as a geeky tech guy coming from the world of AI, that in the real world of commerce, there are countless reasons why people choose particular suppliers, and cost is just one reason. So just flagging to someone that they can buy their syringes 50p or a pound cheaper doesn't necessarily mean that that person's going to buy them. And just reflect for a second, even if the cost was the only reason, imagine going to your boss, you've been buying syringes for the last 20 years and paying £1.50 for them at at a unit cost, and you suddenly say, well, actually, boss, I've discovered that my colleagues down the road have been getting into 50p. It's not going to actually be a great message for you to take to your boss that you've been overspending for all that period of time. So as an aside, when we began to realise that these price variances weren't getting acted upon, we began to look at other ways we could get that information out in a more positive manner. So we actually linked that work with another system called Green Insights that told people the carbon footprint and how much of a reduction in the carbon footprint would accrue if they bought, bought purchased syringes from X supplier instead of Y supplier. And that actually helped people take advantage of the price variances we identified. Nonetheless, at the time, this was big news. It was on the front pages of many of the newspapers, 500 million per year um, potential savings. It was actually debated in Parliament. But like many bubbles in AI, it's not something that you hear about so often now. Now, on the screen behind me are three 
example applications of deep learning, which is a particular type of neural network technology that's very, become very common and which in the news these days, that to me seem almost magical. On the right of the screen, you see a deep learning neural network processing a gray level image. And that's an image that doesn't have any color information in it at all. And using just gray level image, the deep learning neural network produces a believable colored image of me. If you know anything about color physics at all, that seems to be just not possible. But it, there you are, you're seeing it in front of your eyes. It, we can't guarantee, there's no way that's actually a ground truth. There's no claim that that coloured representation is actually the colours that pertained when that image was taken. But it does nonetheless produce a believable coloured image. That seemed astonishing when we began to work on that. But again, the firm that was funding this was very interested. They had a big library of black and white photographs which they sold to magazines and newspapers. It would be very helpful for, for them if they could market some of their black and white images as coloured images to some of their buyers. And so this we'll is We said we're going to train this, we're going to give our Just system... A minute. I'll need to pause that a second. On the top right of the screen, on the, on the conversely, we see a system from IDS. And again, <coughs> when, I got, when I began my work in artificial intelligence in, in 1982, I, be, I initially began to work in computer vision. And the thought that we might have in 2015, 2016, a system that could take a real-time video stream and automatically track something as complex as a company logo, DHL, in real time would have seemed astonishing to me. And yet that's what we can do now. So that system enables you to track a logo in video stream in real time and that enables you to sell that information to advertisers. Imagine you're watching a football game, you can see how many, how for how long your logo is within say 10 pixels of the ball and that can actually add value um, to your advertising. Now the third example of deep learning that seems almost magical it comes, I want to introduce Peter Norvig to tell you about it. Uh, 10 million YouTube videos but for the first experiment, we'll just pick out one frame from each video. <coughs> and uh, so you sort of know what YouTube looks like. We're going to feed in all those images, and then we're going to ask it to represent the world. And so what happens? Well, this is YouTube, so there will be cats. <laughs> and what I have here is a representation of two of the top-level features. So the images come in, they're compressed, uh, we build up representations of uh, what's in all the images, and then at the top level, some representations come out, these basis functions, these features that are representing the world. And the one on the, uh, the left here uh, is sensitive to cats. So these are the images that uh, most excite uh, this node in the network, the best matches to that node in the network. And the other one is a bunch of faces on the right. And then there's... Uh, you know, tens of thousands of these uh, nodes, and each one picks out a different subset of the images that it matches best. So one way to represent what is this feature is to say this one's cats and this one's people, although we never gave it the words cats and people, it's able to pick those out. We can also ask this uh, feature, this neuron or node in the network, uh, what would be the best possible picture that you would be uh, most excited about? And uh, by a process of mathematical optimization, we can come up with that picture. And here they are. Yeah. And maybe it's a little bit hard to see here, but uh, that looks like a cat, pretty much. And that definitely looks like a face. So the system, just by observing the world without being told anything, has invented these concepts. Invented these concepts. We have a system, an AI, that is inventing these concepts. My ears pricked up when I heard Peter say that. In case you haven't come across Peter's work before, and I would have thought anyone who's had anything to do with AI most certainly will have done, Peter Norvig is one of the fathers of artificial intelligence and currently the director of research at Google. Now, in this work, Peter's group ran experiments that asked informally, if we think of our neural network as simulating a very small scale newborn brain and show it YouTube video for a week, what will it learn? The team's hypothesis that it would learn to recognize common objects in the videos. Indeed, to their amusement, one of the artificial ne neurons learned to respond preferentially to images of cats. 
Now, remember, this network has never been told what a cat is. It's never been given a labelled image of a cat. Instead, the claim is from Peter that it discovered what cats were just by looking at these unlabeled videos from YouTube. That's what Peter meant by self-taught learning. Now, <coughs> Peter's group in a groundbreaking paper, Peter's group in a groundbreaking paper from 2012, Conjecture, and I have to read this. The focus of this work is to build high-level, class-specific feature detectors for an unlabeled data. For instance, we would like to understand if it's possible to build a face detector using only unlabeled data. This approach is inspired by the neuroscientific conjecture that there exist highly class-specific neurons in the human brain, generally, generally, and informally known as grandmother neurons, which in turn they exist, this had weights to the philosophical conundrum of whether there exist natural kinds of entity. Now, part of my background is in analytic philosophy. I was lucky enough to spend some time at the University of Reading studying that. And I was aware that the very existence of natural kinds is kind of an unsolved problem in analytic philosophy. So when we're getting the group from Google, the, uh, the group, group from Google, claiming that um, we can develop a system that can automatically learn for itself what a cat is, effectively suggesting there's some kind of natural kind of cats in the world, my skeptics ears and alarm bells began to ring. This didn't sound quite true. And I want to come back to this particular example later on in the presentation. Now, <coughs> can you just give, to give me an idea of your expertise, who here has played around with TensorFlow or CAFE or any deep learning toolkit? So I've had some ideas of using. Thanks. If you've tried learning some complicated tasks, those of you who have used deep learning for real, You've got a comp we might, well, for example, consider the, um, the gray level coloration problem that we saw that our group developed. Imagine you've got access to a high spec PC, a number of graphics coprocessors. Just, I'm going to give you three classes of time for how long it might take to learn that particular mapping. Under an hour, under a day, or under a month. Now, can you put your hand up if you think with a very fast state of our neural network workstation, we could learn that mapping in under an hour? A couple of you. Under a week. Anyone think it might take up to a month? Just a handful. Well, actually, that's how long it took. Um, deep learning, and there's a good reason for this, if any of you know your deep learning theory, is absolutely CPU intensive or GPU intensive. It takes a long time to do complicated things. Effectively because your delta term, if you're using a gradient descent learning method, becomes asymptotically small with an increase in the number of layers in your deep learning neural network. So, and that training time effectively the limits the application of deep learning technologies in the real world. It's unlikely without very dedicated high performance hardware or a very simple problem that you're going to get many deep learning applications running in real time, for example, on your phone. Conversely, and all the effort these days is, is tends to be looking at graphics coprocessors, putting extra hardware to get your deep learning technology working in a reasonable time, and I believe that's the kind of hardware that Apple have invested into in their, in their latest generation of phones. But just imagine if you can turn the, nail on, uh, turn the tables on their heads, and this is what we're trying to do at TCIDA at the moment. We're trying to think, can we, come a, can we develop a deep learning learning algorithm that doesn't take tens of millions or billions of training example pairs to learn the mapping you want, but can learn them in a few hundred or perhaps a few thousand presentations? 
Now, I'd love to be able to say we've solved the problem, we have this now, and I'd be a very wealthy man, no doubt, if I, if I could say that, make that claim. We can't, but our, all I can say is our early work in this area is certainly promising. But what, <coughs> I gave some examples earlier on of the sorts of AI projects that I've been involved with and the group at TCIDA at Goldsmiths have been involved with. But in general, what kind of problems can we use neural networks to do? Now, one of my great academic heroes from the world of machine learning is Andrew Ng from Stanford and Baidu. And Andrew said, suggested that if a task only takes a few seconds of human judgment and at its core merely involves an association of vector A with a vector B, then that task might be ripe for imminent AI automation. And Andrew, in this table, gave a few examples of, of problems that have been automated by AI and neural networks in this way. So examples of some, of some associations might be if your input is an image, a picture, your output might be, is that image of a face or not? If your input is, for example, data on a loan application, your output might be, will the person be likely to repay that loan? You might have some input that's an audio clip, and you might want the output of that audio clip transcribed. The input to your system might be an English sentence, and your output might you want it to be a French sentence or a Spanish sentence. You might have some input that corresponds to sensor data, and you might want to know what's the likelihood a particular part is about to fail. Or you might have some input that's video, and you might want to know, does that video illustrate the position of other cars on a road, for example? So those are the sorts of tasks that deep learning neural networks can do. <coughs> and in the classification tasks, what we're interested in is representing our data as manifolds. Each manifold represents a different e entity. And understanding that data comes from separating those manifolds. And if we have some algorithms, like, for example, support vector machines, might do that separation by effectively stretching, squishing and squashing the data space so that the data manifolds become very cleanly separated. That's what's going on in neural classifiers. Well, <coughs> those are the sorts of tasks that we can use AI on. But <coughs> I think there are two, I want to suggest to you, there are two fundamental questions about the use of AI in neural networks that people who are interested in AI and neural networks really ought to think about, because they strike at the heart of what we can and can't do. The first question says, is every task that a human can think and execute, is every task that a human, that a human can do, can, a machine, can we engineer an AI to do that task? As we'll see later, I think there are some p possible grounds for putting a question mark over that. But whilst I was chair of the AISB, I carried out a poll of our members. Now, the AISB is an academic organisation, primarily with some input from industry. But its members are nearly all people who are working at the coalface. These are people like yourselves who are actually designing, coding and writing AI applications. Now, as someone who, if they're known for much in the world of AI, is known for being something of a skeptic about AI, I mean me, it came to me as a, as a great shock and disappointment that the majority of our members, when polled, actually answered that question, the first question, in the positive. They thought, yep, you give me a problem and give me enough time and money and I'll get you an AI solution for it. They couldn't see any reason in general the members couldn't see any particular a priori reason why every human task could be automated. Now, the second and related question is can, and I think just before I go on to that, there, there's some evidence to back up that positive, conclu positive conclusion. If you just look at some of the examples of AI in, in recent years, 
I didn't ever th think I would live to see an AI system beat the world's best Go player, just because of the way that the game tree expands so rapidly in Go. And yet we have. We've seen IBM's Watson beat the best Jeopardy players, a problem that fundamentally involves common sense reasoning. You've got, in Jeopardy, you've got to, given a statement, which is effectively an answer, you've got to work out what the question was. Like London, and the question might be the capital of England. And that involves, fundamentally, a lot of common sense knowledge. And there were some people in the 60s and 70s who, most notably Dreyfus and Dreyfus, who thought that getting computers to understand common sense knowledge about the world would be a very, very difficult task. So when we've had an AI system that seems to do really well at a problem that's fundamentally involves common sense, that you've, you've got to sit back and take note. So the results of our poll were that the majority of members thought, yep, there was no a priori reason why any task that a human could cognate, could think about, that we couldn't automate that with a suitable AI. Now the second related question is, can we then go on to build what's called in the field an artificial general intelligence. Because at the end of the day, if we've got to engineer a particular AI to every single problem we might ever come across, that's a bit of a pain. It's not quite like the Terminator or the replicant model from Blade Runner where people just seamlessly, just like humans, apply knowledge from one domain to another. If it's the case we've just got to laboriously go through this training process and teach a system on everything they might want it to do, then that's going to limit the actual practical use of AI in the real world. <coughs> but again, the members of the AISB, the oldest society for artificial study of artificial intelligence in the world, by a significant majority, when polled, a majority of members thought that in the time span, coincidentally, predicted by futurologists like Ray Kurtz Vile from Google, Ray's predicted that by the year 2045, we'll have, humanity will have reached an imminent technological singularity when computers will exceed human ability on all intellectual tasks. And that's kind of the result that our members fed back to me in that poll. And I was, I was a little surprised about that. My own perspective is a little more nuanced, a little more skeptical. Now, to begin to understand why I have a degree of skepticism about what AI can do now, or indeed what any computational AI system might do, we need to look at what's going on when AI systems actually work. I put the slide up earlier on, by the way, showing you some of the projects I've been fortunate enough to work on over my career. And that's just to say one thing to you. From this perspective I'm going to give you today it's not coming from a hands-waving philosopher who's never got his hands dirty on coding AI systems in his life. I've, been, I've lived it all my life, all my academic life anyway. And I've got a reasonably large amount of experience, a considerable amount of experience building AI systems. And it's that experience that's brought me to this particular position I want to talk to you today about. So, <coughs> first of all, I want to look at what happens when a deep learning system learns. Now I'm going to give you, first of all, an explanation from Google's Francois Chollet. Francois observed in a chapter in his excellent book published this year on deep learning with Python, um, he, he made the following observation. A deep learning model is just a chain of simple, continuous geometric transforms mapping from one vector space into another. All it can do is map one data manifold, X, onto another data manifold, Y. Assuming the existence of a learnable continuous transform from X to Y. And the availability of a dense sampling of X to Y to use as training data. So, even though a deep learning model can be interpreted as a special kind of program. Inversely, most programs cannot be expressed as a deep learning model. For most tasks, either there exists no corresponding practically sized deep learning neural network that will solve the task, or if there may exist one, it may not be learnable. Most of the programs that one may wish to learn cannot be expressed as continuous geometric morphings of a data manifold. And I was 
delighted when I read that this year. Not least because Francois is a very, very well-known scientist working at one of the most important companies in the world, Google. But in my own small way, because myself and a group of colleagues had made exactly the same claim back in 1999. It was clear to us then that all neural networks were doing were mapping from one vector space to another. And yet we knew from the psychology that not all tasks that humans work on and can do can be solvable by a simple vector association in that way. So that led to what was one reason why we might want to think express a degree of caution when looking at what neural networks can and cannot do. So my position is fundamentally this. I kind of conjecture that the heart of all classical cognitive science, artificial intelligence and artificial neural networks, there hides a ubiquitous computational metaphor. And I suggest that that metaphor is brought forth in three different ways. First of all, in classical, what's become known as good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, there is the view that when humans problem solve and cognize about the world, that cognition is merely computation on symbols. Secondly, there's a notion where computation is implicit in theories of cognitive science. And that's because cogni cognition becomes expressed as computations on sub-symbolic data. I'm talking here about computations on reals. In other words, the sorts of things that neural networks do. And the third way in which this metaphor has seeped itself into the heart of all classical cognitive science, we find in neuroscience. This view that people can do sensible neuroscience via computational neuroscience. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting we throw the baby out with the bathwater. to the people who've done amazing work with computational simulations of the brain. That's not in doubt. And these models, unlike the bat propagation inspired McCulloch Pitts sort of models that classical engineer, that engineers classically use to solve their problems, they're based on things called the Hodgkin Huxley models of neuron action potentials. And these are the kind of models that the Big Brain Project, the EU-funded project to build a computational simulation um, of the cortex uses. They're very high fidelity models of individual neurons. But my point is that each of these is grounded on the notion of computation. And this is important because some of my other work that I'm not going to talk to you today explores different metaphors for how the brain might work. Because computation is only one metaphor. Unlike, say, mass, which is a fundamental objective property of the world, computation's not like that. It's always observer relative. To use an example from Winograd and Flores, from their book, Understanding Computers and Cognition, they describe, if anyone here is old enough, you all look very, very young compared to me, but if anyone here is old enough to remember, um, in the 70s, there were these little chess computers that were like plastic, and they had little plastic check p chess pieces on. And when you played against the computer, it would light up the piece it wanted you to move and the square it wanted you to move it to. Well, imagine that you take that hardware that you're using in one context to play a game of chess, to practice your chess against this machine. That you take that hardware and you wire the inputs to pressure pads now, bear in mind, I'm coming from Goldsmiths, and in case anyone who doesn't know, Goldsmiths is known for its work in arts and humanities, but particularly visual arts. So this kind of has a resonance for me, because it's the kind of thing that mad arty people want to do. So imagine you've got your input to your system, and you're wiring it to pressure pads on the floor. And your outputs are not now little LEDs on a chess computer, but they're huge strips of neon. If any of you have ever seen work by Tracy Emin, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, as I walk through an art gallery treading on these pressure pads, different LEDs will come on on the screen. So now exactly the same piece of hardware is being used to control an interactive work of cybernetic art that was five minutes ago being used for me. I was able to use it to play a game of chess with. 
In other, in other words, to paraphrase the great German philosopher Wittgenstein, I suggest, after John Searle and Putnam, that the meaning of a computation always lies in its use. It's nothing objective, fact of the matter about that. And there are other metaphors. The one that really interests me is of interacting embodied systems, for example, that we can explore that have better, in my opinion, shed more light and more interesting light about the processes going on in the brain. So, is there an impenetrable barrier between computational minds and real minds? I'm going to suggest to you that there is. It's what I call the humanity gap. And to help me lead you to this position, or at least lead you to think about this position, here I've shown three different slides of some funny, th what to me are interesting issues that have caused problems for AI. This is an automatic video captioning AI system. And it observes that here we have a young boy holding a baseball bat. Now, computers make mistakes. That's fine. We make mistakes. We expect our AI systems to occasionally make mistakes. But if a computer had understood an image, that's just not the kind of mistake you would expect it to make. If it said it's holding up a blue toothbrush instead of a white one, or a white one that didn't have any blue on, some fine judgment like that, we might think, oh, fair enough, you, 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 you're vaguely on the right track. But to say that's a young boy holding a baseball bat, I don't think anyone, even any five- or six-year-old child, even my three-year-old child would make that kind of error. It's not the kind of error a human would not make. Because I want to put to you that humans understand images in a way that fundamentally computers don't. Now the second, and this is one of my favourites, and forgive me if you've come across this before. I use it in my works. One of the examples that actually prompted me to accept the invitation to get involved in the International Committee for Robot Arms Control because it genuinely terrifies me, the thought of autonomous systems interacting that control weapons because things can escalate really, really quickly. And when you have, imagine South Korea and North Korea I know for a fact that South Korea does now have autonomous robot sentry guards. They're made by Samsung. They're called Samsung SGR A1, if you want to look them up on YouTube. Now, since South Korea's got these things, it's quite possible that North Korea might have them as well. It's, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility to imagine row upon row of autonomous, lethal autonomous weapon systems facing up to each other in a demilitarized zone in Korea. It's fine if AI behaves in an intelligent, respectable, beautiful way, the way we, how its design is intended to, but what happens if things escalate? So here is an example of when things escalated in an amusing way. Pete Lawrence, an academic, a hoary old academic, wrote a book called The Making of a Fly. It was about fly physiology of interest to a small number of people around the world. And the book was published, I'm sure I met rave reviews, but after six months or so, in the, uh, following the, what happens to nearly all academic books, it got remaindered, put in the remainder bin, and kind of forgotten about. Now, those of you who used Amazon, which I'm guessing is probably most people in this room, will be aware that when you buy things from Amazon, you can sometimes buy from Amazon, Sometimes there's a whole ecosystem of Amazon resellers. And in this example, we have something amusing happened. We had two Amazon resellers that are totally different business models. And forgive me if I get, remember this the wrong way around. One of them was called ProfNav Books, and the other one was called Bordy Books. Now, for argument's sake, let's imagine that ProfNav Books had a huge warehouse of books that had, just like Amazon, lots and lots of obscure books about physiology. And that's what their specialism is, for argument's sake. They get a request. Someone asks them, have you got the making of a fly by Peter Lawrence? And what their business model is, they send an AI bot loose on the Amazon marketplace whose job it is to go out and track down other people selling this book. And what they do, if they find someone else selling it and they find they're selling it at $1, 
and Profnaf will offer it for sale at 98 cents. In other words, they will undercut the, uh, the cheapest price that book is available on the Amazon marketplace by a small margin. Now, Bordy books have entirely the other opposite strategy. They maintain a very small warehouse. And for them, when they get asked for a book, say, The Making of a Fly by Peter Lawrence, they send their AI bots out across the Amazon reseller market looking for the cheapest price they can buy that book for. And they add an increment to it, say, 27%. Now, you can imagine what happened. This book that you should have been able to buy in a remainder bin for 70 cents in 2011 got bid up to $23 million, $698,655, 93 cents and 3.99 postage and packing. And as far as I'm aware, that is the dearest book there's ever been on Amazon. And the key point here is that these systems were interacting without meaningful human control because they didn't know what they were doing. The computers did not know the meanings of the bits they were so adroitly manipulating. And you get these stupid things happening, this artificially stupid... I prefer the, the name artificial stupidity than artificial intelligence because I think it really nails. These things don't understand anything about what they're doing. Not anything. They might be manipulating apples, bananas, books. The computer doesn't know what it's manipulating, what its programs are talking about. The third example comes from a, an incredible guy at Oxford University, a guy called Roger Penrose. If any of you watched that film about Stephen Hawkins, uh, what's it called, Beautiful Mind, was it? I can't remember now. Any, help me out, anyone? Can anyone remember? Through everything, yeah. Now, one of the interesting things that I hadn't clocked when I saw that film, because I've actually debated these issues with Stephen Hawkins in The New Scientist a year or so back. And it's not every day you get to proclaim a well-loved international polymath wrong about anything. But I do think that Hawkins was wrong about his pronouncements about having to fear an imminent AI apocalypse in the same way that I think Elon Musk is misguided. But what was particularly interesting to me, having watched that film, is that Stephen was taught at Oxford by Professor Roger Penrose. And Penrose, in a much bigger way than me, is known as a, as a full-time sceptic about what, uh, what rule-based systems, what AI systems, computational systems, can do. And just a few, about, about a year ago, Penrose, on his, one of his websites, put up this problem that kind of illustrates how computer systems don't understand what they're doing. It's a chess problem. Now, I'm no great chess... I'm <laughs> to say I'm no great chess player is an exaggeration. I'm virtually no chess player at all. But even I, with enough guidance, can see that that position fairly rapidly is a position for a draw. And what was interesting, and when Penrose put some of the best this position... It's a legal position, by the way, into some of the best off-the-shelf chess programs that you could get access to, they thought and thought for ages because of the... Uh, superiority um, in one position. They, they, the programs kept looking and looking and looking, thinking there must be a victory when there wasn't one. And I su suggest that the common element in each of those three problems that underpins them is the fact that the computer doesn't understand. That's why the computer is making these errors. Now, I said I wanted to come back to the work of Google and their, um, their networks that were scanning, the, uh, scanning YouTube feed and had allegedly got a cat detector. Well, once upon a time Google had a good rep as a country, then it thought things kind of turned, turned sour. But I, one of the things I do like about Google, and when you've had the head of Google saying, Peter saying, announcing we have systems that are giving evidence and support of grandmother neurons, when another paper was published just a couple of years later from Segredi, which totally undermined Peter's position. Because what Segredi showed is you can get, that you can take any classifier, deep learning classifier neural network system that's been taught, for example, to respond preferentially to cars, and you can, by using a certain mathematical transform, 
transform that image in a way that's imperceptible to a human observer, but which you can guarantee lifetime, money back, guarantee the network will then misclassify. So whatever the hell that network is doing, it's sure as hell not learning the concept of what a car is or what a cat is. Now the second point about computers and understanding goes back to 1980. And this was one of the key things that happened in my academic development uh, when I came across this argument. I started work as a postgrad, like most postgrads working in AI, very excited and fully confident that I would, might help one day make some incremental knowledge that would lead us to building intelligent, thinking, sentient machines. And then John Searle, Chinese Zoom argument, hit me on the head. And it hit me on the head so much so that in 2002, at the 21st anniversary of the argument, I published a book where we interviewed, or we got papers from, 10 of the leading, very leading philosophers in the world, and 10 leading AI scientists to reflect on the importance of Searle's argument 21 years down the line. If anyone's interest, interested, it's called Views into the Chinese Room. Now, for those, if there are any people here who don't know what the Chinese Room, room argument is, I'll give you a very, very, very quick run through now. The take home point, if you want to switch off and check your email for a couple of seconds, is simply this, that syntax is never sufficient for semantics. The mere syntactical execution of computer programs can never bring forth genuine meaning. How did Searle come to that conclusion? Well, back in the day, before 1980, Searle was on a sabbatical in an AI lab. Searle is an internationally known philosopher who, at that point in time, was best known for his work on, in, on a particular type of philosophy called intentionality. And um, <coughs> Searle was wandering around this AI lab, run by Shank and Abelson, who were doing work on machine understanding of stories. And not Shank and Abelson, they were far too wise to do something like this, but some of their postgrads said to Searle, wow, we've got systems that for the first time actually understand stories. You can ask these systems questions and they'll give you answers about these stories that are indistinguishable from those that a human would give. We have systems that understand. Now, as an aside, we're not talking war and peace. We're not even talking Lord of the Rings. We're talking stories of the form Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. And the questions that you could ask of these systems were not things like, does Jack believe in God? What's the meaning of life? No, they were questions of the form who went up the hill? And the computer would reply, Jack went up the hill. Why did he go up the hill? To get a pail of water. So that was what was going on in the lab. Furthermore, Searle understood the process by which these systems were coming up with these answers, which on a first approximation were kind of the answers that a human would give. So Searle imagined himself. Searle is a monoglot English speaker. He only speaks English. And he imagined himself being locked in a room in China. And in that room, three piles, this illustration shows them in buckets, but in the original thought experiment, there were piles of paper on which were inscribed strange and eldritch symbols, the like of which Searle had never seen before. On a table in the room was a huge, big, fat grimoire. And in this grimoire were instructions written in English, which Searle did understand. And the, instruction, and the instructions were rules of the form if you see a squiggle in pile one and a squoggle in pile two, and it would give examples of these, then put a squiggle squoggle symbol in pile three. And some of them would say, if you see a squiggle squoggle in pile two, then output a squoggle squoggle through a letterbox to people outside the room. And so I got very, very good at following these rules, and there were tens of thousands of them. It was really tedious, but he got really good at doing it. Well, unbeknownst to Searle, who just did not understand anything about the symbols that he was manipulating, the first pile of symbols was a script in Chinese, a set of expectations, stereotypical expectations that unfold in time. The second was a story. 
And the third pile were questions about that story, and the things that Searle was putting through letterbox to people in the outside world were answers to questions about that story in Chinese, also in Chinese. So from the point of view of people outside the room, Searle's giving beautiful answers to questions about a story in Chinese, although Searle trenchantly keeps insisting he doesn't know a word of Chinese. Now, there's been a huge academic literature built up about this over the years since the, the thought experiment was, was, was first published, but I, for one, am fairly convinced by the central claims of Searle's work, which fundamentally doesn't attack any particular AI technology. It targets what can be achieved by any computer program, because that's just, Searle's book is effectively just a computer program which he is dry running. So any AI technology is vulnerable to the Chinese room argument. Now the second reason I have doubt comes from the work of Roger Penrose. I'm not going to have time, I think, to run through my own reasons about, about this, but I, we'll, we'll do Roger's because he's far more eloquent than I am. So Roger, <coughs> Um, he's going to talk to you about Penrose tiling. Imagine a plane stretching away into infinity. The task is to decide whether it can be covered all the way out to infinity without gaps or overlaps using different kinds of geometric shapes or tiles. If we have just one shape of tile, say this regular hexagon, the answer is obviously yes. shape is this irregular pentagon, the answer again turns out to be yes. But if the shape is this regular pentagon, the answer now is an obvious no. We can also consider combinations of tile shapes. If we allow the use of this four-pointed star, as well as the regular pentagon, then the answer is now yes. Though we do not ever literally cover the infinite plane, when we see enough of the pattern, we can become confident that it will cover the plane. We can see this. Could a computer be programmed to answer correctly yes or no to the question of whether a particular tile shape or combination would cover the plane? Being algorithmic in operation, it would have to have a program, rules to follow. What might they be? It's noticeable with the example so far that where the shapes successfully tiled the plane, in doing so, they created repeating patterns. This insight could be programmed into the computer. It would know to answer yes, if it detected that the pieces could be arranged in a way that produces repeating patterns. But does the answer yes occur only with shapes that create patterns that repeat? Look at this pair of shapes. The answer is yes. The shapes cover the plane, but they do not create a repeating pattern. The computer would be stumped. It could use its brute computing power to keep trying the shapes to see if they could fit and create a repeating pattern. Failing in this, the computer would wrongly answer that the shapes will not tile the plane. We could tell our computer that this particular kind of non-repeating arrangement also gives the answer yes. But that wouldn't solve the general tiling problem. To do that, we would have to keep supplying new insights like this forever. But the machine's meant to be computing this, not relying on our insights. No computer, no matter how powerful, could ever be able to finish a computation which would enable it to solve the general tiling problem for the entire infinite plane. The solution is literally non-computable. I'm just going to very briefly say that the third of these arguments, um, which is an argument I've developed, um, called the Dancing with Pixies Reductio Ad Absurdum, 
And in this argument, I show that if it is the case that a computer system instantiates feeling, feels the sharpness of a slap, or smells the ineffable scent of a rose, for example, if a computer program can ever bring forth feeling, then conscious feeling is everywhere. Panpsychism is true. And that's such an alien belief that I suggest that we're drawn to reject the first horn of the reductio and reject the idea that computers ever can instantiate phenomenal consciousness. So it's quite a technical argument. I'll be very happy to talk about it uh, later in the day if any of you are interested. But if, or you can look it up. But it's, if correct, I will show that computers will always lack sensation. So, to conclude, deep stupidity is the view that intelligence is rooted socially, solely in ratiocination and computation. And this is a relatively modern view and a view that has not gone unchallenged. Indeed, I've challenged this fairly powerfully, I hope, in a paper entitled The Cognitive Computing Fallacy, Compu Cognition, Computations and Panpsychism, in one of the early editions of the Cognitive Computing Journal back in 2009. I've highlighted in that paper three areas that seem to me fundamentally different from computers and humans. The first is that computers cannot, now nor ever will, understand the meaning of the bits they so adroitly manipulate. Second, following Roger Penrose, that computers now and always will lack mathematical insight and generalizing from that creative insight. And thirdly, that computations cannot explain sensations. Taken together, I think those arguments show there is a fundamental humanity gap between what can be achieved computationally and the human mind. And on the plus, if that's a negative result, the final point I want to leave you with is that cognitive science hasn't moved, uh, hasn't stood still. This computational view of the mind is rooted in the work of philosophers like Putnam in the 60s who brought forth a theory of mind called functionalism, which led to computationalism. But cognitive science has moved on. These days, this is the new boy in or girl in town that's ex causing the excitement. The views that the mind and our cognition is fundamentally embodied. You can think of the old view of cognitive science that thought that the essential aspects of our cognitive processes were kind of disembodied. It's actually kind of a dualist position because they thought you could understand the essence of what it is to cognize in a computer program that's distinct from the body that it's, uh, of a person. Well, new cognitive science inverts that and says cognition is fundamentally embodied. It's inactive. It's we bring forth our worlds. It's embedded in a culture, and it's based on ecological cognitive science principles. So there's, that's a flavor of some of these other approaches to cognitive science that are not computational in view. The world has moved on. And so with that, I think it's time for me to thank you for your attention.